Welcome everyone to Women Transforming Our Nuclear mm -hmm. Legacy. Thanks to all of you who are joining us from many countries around the world across many, many time zones. We are honored to have with us today an extraordinary group of women mentors, all of whom are dedicating their lives to transforming our nuclear legacy through storytelling. And we are honored to have all of you with us today, all of us all of you who have been with us before and all of you who are joining us for the very first time. Thank you all for joining us to claim your seat at the table, to change our nuclear story, to eliminate nuclear weapons. I wanna express my gratitude to the Plowshares Fund Women's Initiative for their generous support in making this program possible. Plowshares has been leading the quest to eliminate nuclear weapons since they got started in the early 1980s. I wanna honor Plowshares founder now, Sally Lilienthal, who dedicated her life and heart and soul to this. We wouldn't be here without Sally and we wouldn't be here without Plowshares. I now wanna welcome my dear friend and teacher, beloved elder in our community here on the island of Kauai, Kumu Hula Puna Dawson, who will be opening our session and closing our session with a blessing for peace. Puna shares the spirit of aloha wherever she goes. She travels the world sharing aloha and building bridges of peace between the peoples of the Hawaiian islands and peoples of other countries. Welcome dear Auntie Puna. We're so happy that you're with us this morning. Aloha, mahalo, and please share your blessing with us now to open the session. Aloha kakahiaka. I'm so honored to be part of this gathering. And um, thank you, Tom, for your continued support. Um, I want to say that many things come, you know, when we open, open our arms, many people come. And in Hawaiian thought, we kuka kuka, we tell stories. It's through the stories that we're able to share who we are, where we come from, and what our intentions are, especially in helping to create this blanket of peace throughout the world. I thank you all for all of the stories that you bring to all of us, especially helping us to see your vision, your insight. Our queen, Lili Uokalani, in some of her darkest moments, she wrote such beautiful songs when she was imprisoned in her palace. And these songs come to light in her story of the time that she was imprisoned. She wrote and spoke to her people through the trash can, believe it or not, her trash was taken out daily and she wrote in Hawaiian metaphor. And one of the things that she said was ho'okahi puana, let us come together, all of us, because our story is not going to end. We the people that speak from the heart, only as one voice of the world can we continue to be the life and love for all. So as our blessing for today or our intention for, day, for today, I'm going to share this. It's in a song, a very simple one. And it goes like this. Ho'okahi puana ko'upu'uhai O ka po e i aloha, e ka lahu. Let us put our hands together, all of us, and breathe into your hands. Lift it up. And now we share throughout the world our breath and our intention of peace. Aloha, mahalo. Oh, th thank you, Auntie Puna. Mahalo for that beautiful, 
sharing about our queen and storytelling and sharing breath and coming together now all of us it really um, is a perfect way a beautiful way for us to open our conversation today mahalo we'll see you at the end mahalo, yes. mahalo. mahalo. so we have planted many seeds in our first two sessions that we'll be going deeper on today we have looked at nuclear dangers and why we're at a greater risk of a nuclear catastrophe today than at any time in history we have learned about the disproportionate impact of nuclear weapons on indigenous peoples and peoples of color and the disproportionate impact of nuclear weapons on women and girls, of, of ionizing radiation on women and girls. We have learned about the steps we can take to avoid a nuclear catastrophe like no first use and about Global Zero's sound and verifiable pathway to get to zero nuclear weapons. And we have learned about the landmark treaty for the prohibition of nuclear weapons from Ambassador White, who negotiated the treaty at the UN, and from Ray Acheson, who has worked so hard on the treaty. As many of you know, right after our last session, it was announced that the treaty was ratified by Honduras, which was the 50th country needed to enter the treaty into force, which will happen on January 22nd, 2021. We still have a long way to go to move the nuclear armed states to give up their nuclear weapons. But this is a moment to recognize and celebrate. And with deep gratitude to Ambassador White, to Ray, to ICANN and all who work so hard on the treaty and in recognition of this moment, I wanna share what Ambassador White said when I asked her about what's the significance and the impact it would be when the treaty entered into force. So Tom, if you can please play just those, that clip from Ambassador White. And it is going to be for the first time that in international law, this is this is something that really is really outstanding. Um, countries not only reject, we consider them illegal and not legitimate, not legitimate instruments of security for the 21st century. And that the any use of such weapons will be abhorrent to the principles of humanity and the dictates of, of um, human conscience. This is going to be a very strong uh, way in which we turn around the official discourse from nuclear weapons are necessary to nuclear weapons are illegal and unacceptable. And that is going to have an impact in, in policy making. Very inspiring words from Ambassador White. She talked about the enormous work to head to bring the nuclear armed states on board. And she said that like the abolition of slavery, this is going to take time, but the winds of change are now blowing strong and a new window of opportunity to eliminate nuclear weapons has arrived once and for all. So I just wanna say, may it be so. The theme of our session today is storytelling to transform our nuclear legacy. The power of story. The power of story to catalyze change. When I think about the power of story to transform our nuclear legacy, what comes to mind is a line from Shakespeare in the play Hamlet, when Hamlet says, the play's the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. This is because when I think of the most powerful illustration of the power of story to catch the conscience of the king and transform our nuclear legacy, I think of what happened when President Ronald Reagan watched the ABC TV movie, The Day After, which depicted a full scale nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union and the impact of this war on American families in the Midwest. This was in 1983 at the height of the Cold War and just a few months earlier, Reagan had called the Soviet Union the evil empire and the focus of evil in the modern world. He was swept up in a enormous arms race and carrying out what was at that time the largest nuclear military buildup in history. He wanted to be prepared to fight a nuclear war. The day after touched Reagan to his core 
and opened his heart, led him to have a change of heart. Within two years, he was on his way to Geneva and then there meeting with Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev and they were talking about eliminating weapons, and I quote, from the face of the earth. This is the power of story. We're here today because it's an existential imperative that we write a new nuclear story and that women lead the way because excluding women from decision-making and policy-making for most of the nuclear age has brought us to the brink of possible extinction. Best-selling author Elizabeth Lesser has come out with a compelling new book, Cassandra Speaks, When Women Are the Storytellers, the Human Story Changes. We have three exceptionally gifted women storytellers with us today who are all doing just that, each in her own way, purposing storytelling to change our human nuclear story, awaken us, touch our hearts, and inspire us to act, to transform our nuclear legacy, to eliminate nuclear weapons. I wanna welcome our mentors now. Welcome Togjan, Lisa, Mary, we're so honored to have you with us. And I'm gonna start by introducing you all. Mary Dixon is a downwinder who has spent decades writing and speaking about the human cost of nu US nuclear testing. Her play Exposed, which premiered in Salt Lake City and has had subsequent staged readings across Utah in Oregon, California and elsewhere was nominated for the Steinberg Award for Best New Play Produced Outside of New York. She most recently was a featured speaker at the national virtual event, Still Here, 75 Years of Shared Nuclear Legacy, commemorating the 75th anniversary of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In 2015, she addressed the International Conference on Victims of Nuclear Weapons in Hiroshima. She has testified at hearings, written op-eds and articles, spoken at universities and colleges, and participated in symposia across the country. The Alliance for Nuclear Accountability has recognized her for her lifetime work on behalf of downwinders. Tog Jean Casanova is a senior fellow at the Center for Policy Research at the State University of New York, Albany, and a native of Kazakhstan. She is an expert in nuclear politics and weapons of mass destruction non-proliferation and a former advisor to the United Nations Secretary General on Disarmament Affairs. A professor and researcher, Togjan is finishing a book on Kazakhstan's nuclear story, including the impact of nuclear testing on the people of Kazakhstan. She also works on financial crime prevention to prevent proliferators from using the global financial system to finance weapons of mass destruction programs. Lisa Perry is the Digital Communications Director for the William J. Perry Project and creator and host of the At The Brink podcast. Lisa was motivated to enter the nuclear field after her grandfather, former Secretary of Defense William Perry, wrote a book declaring nuclear weapons a greater threat to human existence today than ever before. Inspired by her grandfather's many intimate accounts of dealing directly with a nuclear threat, Lisa conceived of the idea for a podcast that explored the personal impact of the often difficult to grasp issues surrounding these weapons. At the Brink was launched in July 2020 and focuses on revealing the untold human element that plays into nuclear issues while outlining the major concepts the public needs to understand to enact lasting change. The first season of At the Brink features a wide range of voices, including members of Congress, physicists, former missileers, A-bomb survivors, and a former president. Welcome to you all. So happy to have you with us. Thank you so much for being here. Togjan, we're gonna to start with you. And I just wanna say that you have been gathering stories for over a decade, and you are so dedicated that you just returned last week. You traveled all the way from Washington, DC to the remote, remote villages of Kazakhstan in the middle of this pandemic to visit with the downwinders, their children and grandchildren, to listen to and record more stories because you are so compelled to do this. Thank you for your courage and for all that you're doing and welcome, welcome, welcome. 
Thank you so much, Cynthia. Um, so my first question for you is, what was the turning point moment in your life? What moved you to dedicate yourself to sharing the story of the impact of nuclear testing on the people of Kazakhstan? The story of the nuclear legacy still unfolding in your homeland today. Why is this personal for you? And why have you chosen, chosen storytelling as a catalyst for change, as a way to make a difference? I think the first moment that started my journey, um, and, and my nuclear journey was almost 20 years ago when I was um, finishing my master's degree in Great Britain. And uh, when I realized that I want to work on international security issues and when I thought about where I can contribute and what moves me and what makes me passionate, I had a very pretty clear, I had a, a clear idea that it should be nuclear politics. And that was for two reasons. One was very personal because I come from a family um, in which my father was an advisor to the Kazakh government in the early 90s when Kazakhstan was deciding whether to give up Soviet nuclear weapons or not. And my father passed away early. And so I, 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 I felt compelled to continue his legacy, to follow his footsteps and to work on um, nuclear disarmament issues. The second motivation to look at, at nuclear politics was coming from the fact that I was coming from a country for which nuclear politics was such a big part of national identity because Kazakhstan was used by the Soviet weapons program um, in many ways to mine uranium, to produce nuclear fuel, to test nuclear weapons. And so the journey on nuclear issues started a uh, long time ago. And I'm so excited that Lisa is here because my PhD dissertation is actually on the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, which is um, to which her grandfather has a very direct <laughs> relation. And, and so under the, when I started on nuclear issues, it, it was maybe much later that um, I moved from wanting to record the story of Kazakhstan and how Kazakhstan gave up nuclear weapons um, to the story of humans. Um, when I started reading archival materials and, and meeting people from the region, I realized that I'm interested in nuclear politics, but I'm much more interested and feel um, extremely compelled to tell the stories of, of the people who, who suffered from nuclear testing. And, and so it wasn't an immediate journey, but it was gradual and it was logical. And I'm, I'm really happy to be on this path. And um, I, I, I feel privileged that I have a chance to meet these people and to learn from them. And, um, and, and yes, it, it, it's all very personal to me because also the roots of my family are coming from the region which suffered from the nuclear test. Thank you, Takjan. That's you're, you're so inspiring and such a beautiful way to share how you started all of this. Would love for you to share your presentation now on your journey, sharing the stories about the people of your homeland. And nuclear testing. Okay. I want to start um, my re remarks today by sharing a specific moment when I felt very strongly that what I do for 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 my professional life actually has meaning and that it's not only intellectually interesting, but that lives can be touched by it. And that I, I, I do have a mission and that I, I do want to do something that has some practical implications. And that very strong moment came um, a bit more than a year ago when I traveled to the villages near the former Soviet nuclear testing site in Kazakhstan at Semipalatinsk. And I should preface by saying that uh, before that, for, 
for almost a decade, I would meet victims of Soviet nuclear tests, but in major cities and at the conferences. And I never went to the closest rural areas uh, near the testing site. And I think it's simply, it was simply because I was afraid to get too close, you know, to get too much to the ground, to get to the heart of it, to, to meet the immediate victims of, 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 of nuclear tests. I was also very conscious that people living in these rural areas, by now they're a little bit tired of, um, you know, researchers and scientists coming there and, um, taking bio samples from them, for example, teeth to measure strontium or blood or, you know, other samples. And, and, and of course, I, I have so much respect for science and it's so necessary, but very often these people, they never see the results of this um, very scientific articles they they never hear back from from the scientists and 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 so partly i felt very conscious that i didn't want to be a nuclear tourist i didn't want to be too probing that if i went there i had to go with a lot of respect and sensitivity um, and simultaneously i realized that i cannot um, finish writing my book without going to the villages without actually being as close as I could uh, to these people and to the stories. And, and so um, I went there and um, the first victim that we've met um, on that trip was a little boy. He was at the time six months old. Um, he had... Um, a red growth on, on his head, but um, most strikingly, he had six fingers on one of his hands. He had an extra thumb. Um, and it, it was very powerful that he was the first victim we met in, in those rural areas and that he was so so small, you know, six a six month uh, baby who didn't realize yet um, the life ahead of him and that, you know, for now he was smiling and, uh, but if, if, if an extra thumb remains, he will, you know, he might be bullied or, you know, obviously he will have some, 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 some issues as, as he would continue with his life. And I felt pretty angry because I thought, you know, these are children who had nothing to do with the decisions of, politicians or military and now it's the fourth and the fifth generation of victims and um, their lives are, are changed and are so impacted by something that they had nothing to do with. And, um, and so while for many years I had this feeling that I want to carry the, those stories to the outside world. It's that it's the trip of last year to the rural areas that just clarified uh, so, so powerfully to me that um, I need to tell their stories. I need to tell them in their voice um, and, and that I have to do it in a compelling way, not in, you know, not writing as a, Washington DC policy expert, but rather um, tell those stories in a way that, that moves people, that maybe uh, makes, makes people emotional and, 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 and makes them remember this. The stories makes them remember these this humans and, and maybe makes them think about the, the kind of world we live in. And so with that, I just wanted to give you a bit of a historical background for those who maybe are not very um, familiar with the Soviet nuclear testing program. It was in the late 1940s that the Soviet military chose uh, land in, in Kazakhstan um, as a site for the future nuclear, uh, for future nuclear testing. And uh, it's, it's a huge territory, the, the, uh, it's the size of Hawaii. Um, and it's striking to read the documents from, from, 
from the 40s in which the military discussed uh, why they chose this particular spot. And they would say, this is uninhabited land. Uh, it's, you know, geography is perfect. It's pretty flat. Um, there is uh, access to, uh, to sand and other material that they would need to, um, uh, for construction. And so it was described as, as this desolate, uninhabited, godforsaken Kazakh steppe. Um, but if you are Kazakh, like I am, um, you see the same land in a completely uh, different light. And the first photo you see on your screens now is actually from, from just last week, um, when again, I, I went back to the villages and, um, and there is just so much space. And, you know, this may be, is rough beauty, but to us, it's, it's very moving, it's beautiful and it's powerful. We are genetically uh, moved by, by the space, by the endless steps and the, and the skies. Um, it, it's also, it was a region, uh, very rich in flora and fauna. And on this photo, you can see a rare antelope uh, called Saiga, which actually disappeared once the tests went underway and um, they started to return uh, decades later after the tests uh, were, were not happening anymore. This region is also very special in terms of history and culture. Uh, the nearest major city of Semipalatinsk uh, was a place where in the 19th, starting from the 19th century, merchants from Europe, Russia, and Central Asia would come together and uh, trade goods at colorful markets. And it's also a region that produced some of Kazakhstan's most famous writers and poets. And so it's on this land that the Soviet military decided to, decided and conducted more than 400 uh, nuclear tests, first in the atmosphere and then starting from 1963 on the ground. And over the years I've read um, and, and heard so many eyewitness accounts and today I just wanted to share uh, one of them that no matter how many times I, I, I read it out loud every time, I'm just choking because um, I just find it extremely sad and in, and in a way insulting. Um, so it was in 1955, uh, just before a thermonuclear test and a medical nurse from a village about a hundred kilometers away from the epicenter of the test, she described. On the eve of the test, the military came to our village and gave instructions. In the morning after breakfast, we walked all patients staying in the hospital outside. We put them face down to the ground and covered, uh, and covered them with the bed linen. And uh, I always just think about those people who, you know, who were already vulnerable because they were in the hospital and just imagine being put on the ground and just, you know, the nurses had nothing even to protect them that they, they put them um, um, under this very thin bed leaning. And so, of course, the health issues uh, started arising, cancers, um, which, were, which local doctors were prohibited from reporting, um, a very striking rise in suicides. Women would lose pregnancies or give birth to deformed babies. Um, yeah, the pregnancies would be very difficult, lots of bleeding and, and miscarriages. And then in the late 1980s, due to a combination of many factors, so the test continued for 40 years. And then in the late 1980s, due to a fortunate combination of factors, because in, uh, in the Soviet Union, we had a new leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, who was actually keen to reverse this irresponsible arms race and, and was keen on disarmament. Uh, then he was also liberal and he 
uh, started what we call perestroika, the reform of the Soviet system. He was given a little bit more freedom and, and um, but also on the ground in Kazakhstan, people were just so fed up that they started rising. And so a, a popular, a massive popular anti-nuclear movement against nuclear tests called Nevada Semipalatinsk was born in Kazakhstan. And, um, and I think it's wonderful that it was called Nevada Semipalatinsk. Initially, it was actually called Nevada even without Semipalatinsk because uh, activists, anti-nuclear activists from Kazakhstan, they felt so connected to their American counterparts and they felt inspired by the anti-nuclear movement in, in the United States. And, um, and, and so people started protesting um, rallies, massive rallies. Uh, overnight, the movement grew to, to millions. Um, and what's moving, it wasn't only Kazakhs. And when I say Kazakhs, I mean people of Kazakhstan because Kazakhstan is a multi-ethnic society and it was actually very much reflected in the, in the movement. It was representative of the entire Kazakhstan. So uh, there were Russians and uh, um, Koreans who, who lived in Kazakhstan be because they were deported by, by Stalin and many other nationalities. Uh, but it was not only the people of Kazakhstan who were rallying, uh, they had support from Americans, uh, from Japanese, uh, from, from Russians. And um, I just wanted to, to read the memory from Dan Yan. Uh, the, he at the time was the president of Physicians for Social Responsibility. And he was one of um, Americans who came to participate in those uh, anti-nuclear protests in Kazakhstan. And, and, and he described, in Karaul, that's one of the villages near the former testing site, two or 3,000 people met us and mingled with us in a large field as dozens of their fellow villagers told the sad stories of Soviet downwinders. American downwinders and Hibakusha from Japan told their stories as well. While the stories were tragic, the atmosphere was that of a great celebration. Kazakh musicians and dancers entertained us. Our host in Karaul gave us a glorious feast in yurts, uh, some 40 of which had been erected for the occasion. The children who had never seen foreigners before circulated everywhere asking us to sign their papers. And so if you read the memories of uh, American peace activists, they, they, you see that uh, they drew inspiration from the Kazakhstan's movement, which in turn had been inspired by the Nevada anti-nuclear protests. And, and, and Yan described his emotions after the trip to Kazakhstan. We found ourselves inspired, maybe a little proud to have stood by the side of this extraordinary people. And what I find also uh, very moving that um, the, the representatives of the West Shoshone tribe, uh, they, they also came to Kazakhstan and, and, um, and even the logo of, of Kazakhstan's anti-nuclear movement, it, it, it's not a very <laughs> accurate depiction of the West Shoshone uh, tribe, but you know, they did what they could. But the idea behind this uh, logo is that um, the movement of Kazakhstan, you see a Kazakh elder on the right, that they, they felt very much connected with the plight of downwinders in the United States. And I want to loop us back um, to where I began and that trip to the villages last summer. Um, I'm obviously not a doctor. Well, I am a doctor, but of political science, not a real doctor. And I, I cannot give you a scientific opinion on, on how much today's health issues are directly connected to the legacy of nuclear testing. Intuitively, I think it's a combination of different factors. It's the legacy of, the, of nuclear tests, the genetic uh, impact, but it's also, you know, broad environmental issues with nearby mining uh, and weakened health because of uh, weak um, 
poor infrastructure and so on. Uh, but what I know, if, if you go to those villages, you have to believe your eyes because there are too many people, especially kids, who have uh, very serious health issues and very often visible health issues. And I want to leave you with a story of a family we met on the, on the trip, and you can see the photo on the screen now, uh, which to me represents, the, the story of this family to me represents both the pain, but also resilience of, of people who live there. Uh, that family lost one daughter when she was just six. Uh, the other daughter, um, the older one on this photo, she developed uh, facial bone cancer when she was six, she, she's, she's good now, but for two years she had to, to go through chemo. And the, the youngest daughter, she's actually missing four fingers from one of her hands. And, um, and I saw the medical files of these girls, they're this thick and, um, and it's horrible to see that, you know, on the, on the, on the opening part of the medical file under the, cause of disease, it's actually written out ionizing radiation. So these girls are officially considered to be the victims of uh, nuclear tests. But at the same time, it's a, it's a fully functional, happy family and the girls like to sing and dance and we've kept in touch with them since last summer. And actually, you know, just last week, um, we went to visit them and uh, it was just so wonderful. We were uh, welcomed so warmly and um, it wasn't a sad trip. It was, uh, I don't know, I, it, it was actually inspiring that people who live not in such um, easy conditions and um, who bear so much pain that um, they can still find joy, be resilient, being entrepreneurial, being, you know, good, being a good family. And, um, and it's for families like, like those that I want to do what I, what I can in, in, in kind of in shining light on, on these stories and, and making governments, not only my own government in Kazakhstan, but just governments around the world not forget and care about these people. And uh, because when I observe politicians and diplomats, you know, who sit in those fancy negotiations halls and they talk about nuclear deterrence or nuclear weapons programs and, and, and they just, you know, so comfortably discuss nuclear weapons as something so abstract. I really, I really wish they they would go there to the ground, to the epicenters and, and, and realize that nuclear weapons programs are, are not abstract, that they actually uh, impact people's lives. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you for giving me a chance to share the story. Talk, John. Uh... Every time I hear this story, I'm both um, very deeply devastated by the suffering and the tragedy, but also very moved and encouraged and inspired by the resilience and the story of the people rising up and bringing an end to nuclear testing and then ultimately being the country that was the first country to give up their nuclear weapons as a model for the world. So, and the the families who are, you know, so resilient. So thank you for bringing this all to us now. And I also just want to say that if any of you have not seen Togjan's TED Talk, we're putting it in the chat now. I would urge you to watch it because it's very moving and she goes deeper with everything that she's just shared. And so Togjan, I have one question I want to ask you now, which is before we move on to our next, to Mary, which is what are your hopes and aspirations for your book? How can women in the session support and spread the word about what you are doing? And are there any opportunities for post-session collaboration or engagement with you or in support of trans transforming the nuclear legacy for the people of Kazakhstan? Is there something that people can do? Um, so, you know, the book that Cynthia mentioned, um, I've been working on it for forever and uh, the deadline is coming, so there is no way back. December first, I have to submit the manuscript, and uh, this book is is really 
a work of love uh, for my country and for these people. And uh, I hope that it will serve a dual purpose, that it will be a recorded history of my country, um, you know, a very important part of my, uh, of my country. Um, but the second, the second purpose is that the, the nuclear story of Kazakhstan goes into the kind of the global uh, narrative of nuclear stories. It's an important case study. Uh, and I think there are many lessons to be learned from, from Kazakhstan's experience. And so I really very much hope that this book will have both um, the historic value just as a, as a record of history, but also that it will maybe move people and be, be seen as a tribute to, to, to these people. And um, uh, anyone who is compelled to read it or uh, learn more about Kazakhstan, I think that would be the greatest gift to me that, you know, if, if, if anyone decides to read it and maybe remember the people of Kazakhstan in, in your work and, and, and share their stories further. Beautiful, Tatjan. Thank you so much for all you're doing and for sharing your incredible story and bringing it to all of us this morning. So grateful to you. Thank you. Mary, I want to come to you next. All right. And I just want to say that you are a downwinder. Mm -hmm. I've known you for just over a week now. Mm -hmm. I cannot believe, I cannot imagine what you have been through and what you're still going through. Mm -hmm. You are okay. dedicating your life to sharing your story, to awakening us to the truth that we're all downwinders, that the legacy of nuclear testing is still with us, not just in those we have already lost, but in the generations being born now and the generations to come. So thank you for your courage, for all mm -hmm. you're doing. We're really honored to have you with us. So I want to start by asking you the question that I asked Tagjan, which is what was the turning point moment in your life? What moved you to dedicate your life to sharing your story of being a downwinder in Utah and the nuclear legacy still unfolding today? And why have you chosen storytelling as a catalyst for change, as a way to make a difference? Okay. First, Cynthia, bless you for doing this and putting it together. And Tajan, I want to talk to you so much more. Um, I think I started out as a journalist. I was writing about these things. I interviewed lots of people who were downwinders. I interviewed people about leaks at the Nevada test site. This was like in the 80s and the 90s. And so I was writing about these things, but I was an observer. And then I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. So I became one of those people I was writing about. And I think that, I mean, nothing makes you an activist faster than a diagnosis. Um, and then I started looking at all the people I knew growing up who had died of cancers and tumors. And we just assumed when we were young that everybody got cancer and tumors and strange diseases. And then my older sister got sick. And um, I think it was her dying and leaving <clears throat> her three children and exacting a promise for me that I would let people know what happened to us, what our government did to us. And I have just learned, I would give speeches and testify at things. And the thing I learned, the thing that got to people, I could give them all the numbers and all the abstract data, but what really got people was telling them a story. I'm just such a firm believer in the power of storytelling. I think it's our most, most powerful tool. And I'm always telling people that. I think you've got to share your story, share your story, because that's what reaches the heart. You can't just reach the mind. You've got to reach the heart of people, just like Reagan saw that film. And I think that's one of the most important things we can do because hearing your stories, Tagjan, they're so similar to the stories I heard um, and that I've lived. And it's 
it's really hard work. And I, I remember what also motivated me, there was a woman and a lot of the people I worked with were women um, in the movement. And she said, Mary, you have to tell the story. We're too sick to tell it. You got better. You, and, and knowledge is responsibility. And I've always felt that. And I think women have such a powerful role to play. There's, there's this idea that it's a nuclear priesthood and only men can belong, but it's women who are gonna change it. It's women who really know how to tell those stories and who care about the next generation. So I, I think we have a really important role to play. Beautiful, Mary, so beautiful. Thanks. That moment with your sister, I didn't know about that. Um, yeah, yeah. So if you would be really honored for you to share your story sure. and, and how it's really impacted your life. Okay, okay, sure. Well, I'm what I call a casualty of the Cold War. The Cold War did have victims. It had victims in Kazakhstan. It had victims across the United States. It had victims in China when they were testing. Um, you know, the United States actually conducted more nuclear tests than anyone else, 928 from 51 to 92, 928. And that number seems mind boggling. But when you think that each of those were far more powerful than the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that legacy of that fallout is devastating. It, it, a devastating legacy, not just in my home state of Utah, but across this entire country. Um, our testing was done in Nevada, again, like in Kazakhstan, they determined this was a no man's land. They called it a low use segment of the population because they just figured that, oh, it's just Indians, cowboys and Mormons who live there. So bomb away. And um, I, you know, and I grew up like, tens of thousands of Americans under those clouds of nuclear testing. Um, my life and my work have been shaped by what happened to me and so many of the people I love at the hands of our own government, all in the name of protecting us. You know, they would say, well, we have to test because of the Soviets. And I'm sure the Soviets talked to saying we have to test because of the Americans. So what we essentially did was kill our own. And for me, the earth really shifted in the spring before my 30th birthday. Um, when I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer, it's those two words. My whole world lost its predictability when they said it's malignant. Um, I mean, I grew up drinking milk from a nearby dairy. I ate fresh vegetables from the garden. We used to mix sugar in the snow to pretend it was ice cream and eat it and play in puddles of rainwater. I mean, and how were any of us to know that there was a silent poison threading its way through our bodies? when our government just repeatedly assured us there is no danger. And they even gave us pamphlets saying that we were playing a great role in this, in, in protecting our country. And that some of you may have been inconvenienced by the test. Those were the words they used. Um, I mean, inconvenience, we were dying. And they told us not to pay attention to Geiger counters um, and not to let them, you know, Geiger counters are going crazy. I said, don't let that bother you. Don't let that bother you. Um, and so there were, we did not know that the radioactive debris and those awe-inspiring clouds that were blowing across the country were devastating families and communities all the way to upstate New York. Um, you know, no sirens rang out. We just blindly went on assuming that just like they told us, all was well, we had nothing to fear. We trusted the government in those days. Um, you know, after I got sick, my sister and I started keeping a list and we came up with 54 people in our childhood neighborhood who had cancers, tumors, autoimmune diseases. And um, that list, I added her name when she was just 46 in 2001 and left those three kids behind. Now, my younger sister is battling a rare form of cancer and my youngest sister has autoimmune disorders they can't quite diagnose. She's been working with doctors at Johns Hopkins and she, they can't quite figure it out. But, but where I'm from, mine is not an unusual story. I mean, other people keep lists as well. They've shown them to me and they all keep growing. And, and sometimes I just feel like I'm forever piling up losses. I've lost so many of those people I worked with in the movement. And, and one of them, a downwinder who knows everything there is to know, he's walking, encyclopedia 
he was at my house just last week after he went to get more chemo and he said, Mary, I know I'm dying. And his, his husband told me, he said, he's not gonna make it. And I just feel like the people who know this story keep dying. And, and these stories are heartbreaking. I mean, a woman who told me she had a child born with all its organs on the outside of its body. And the same as your story talks on that the miscarriages, the, the things that happen. And I think what's really hard for me to reconcile is our government knew these facts. They knew what was happening from the very first test and they lied to us for 40 years. They lied to us. People like me and my sister and all those people I've lost. And I, I think one of the things that really got me is I got a hold of these declassified minutes of the Atomic Energy Commission when they decided to move testing to Nevada. And the meetings they had when they would hear about, um, somehow my thing's going, um, when they would hear about all these losses, the, the farmers losing sheep, losing cattle, and then they would hear about people dying. And do you know what they actually said? Because I have this in a minute. They said, nothing's going to get in the way of testing, nothing. This all depends on the judicious handling of public information, which meant essentially propaganda and lying. So the way I see it, our government deemed this as expendable. And the more research I do, the more I realize this tragic fact. And I think even more tragic is that so few people in America, in our own government, certainly not the current administration, even have an idea of this past, of our legacy. They have no idea. And that's why... I write and speak whenever I can, and I tell our stories because if if we don't do that, those stories die with us. And then who's going to bear witness? Who's going to tell them? Um, there, there's a, a woman who wrote a book called Half Lies and Half Truths, and she said nuclear testing did not prevent nuclear war; it was a nuclear war. And and I really believe that. And as you said, people are still getting sick, the genetic damage. Um, we're still living with fallout, and too many of us have become ill, and too many of us have had to bury the dead. I've been sliced and scooped out and um, radiated. I've watched my sister take her last breath in agony, and I just keep watching more of these people who know this story and who lived it, who, who were losing. Um, just on a walk the other day, a friend of mine down the street told me she hadn't been in touch because she found out she has ovarian cancer. Um, and I think my fear that these stories die with us is why I think mentoring is so incredibly important. We, we need a new generation of activists who know the story, who can go on because we won't be here for living, I mean, forever. And I mean, my experience, what I've learned, it just made me incredibly passionate about that, that, that these not be forgotten, whether here, whether in Kazakhstan, whether in China, whether in the Marshall Islands, because when you look at nuclear testing worldwide and the number of people who've been affected, it's mind boggling. And my hope is just that all of us from these nations around the globe will do, and especially those of us who know firsthand what it does to the human body and to our communities, that we work together to ensure that no government ever again uses nuclear weapons. Because, I mean, like I always say, we all live downwind. So that's my story. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's, um, thank you for bringing it forward and being, oh, yeah. being able to do that and not be um, you know, held back and debilitated by all that you've been through. Thank you for, yeah. thank you for trying, oh, yeah. turning this into um, a sharing for change. Uh, it takes a lot yeah. to do it. I know, it's, I know it's not easy for you. It's not. <laughs> so I, I want you, you, you carry a map in yes. your wallet. Yes. Yes. everywhere you go yeah so that you can share this map with anybody who will listen i want right um, tom if you could put the map in the chat yeah put and, that map up and can you explain to us what this yes. map is yes 
this is a map, Richard Miller, who's the author of the book, Under the Cloud, The Decade of Nuclear Testing, The Decades of Nuclear Testing. What he did is he got data from the Atomic Energy Commission from the nuclear or the Defense Nuclear Agency and the US Weather Service to show where fallout, you can see the Nevada test site down there in the lower corner, from where fallout from testing blew with the jet wind across the country and then fell out as rain or snow. Um, and this just looks at above ground testing, any area that was passed by at least three nuclear clouds. I mean, you can see it where my state's almost all red, but it goes through the Midwest. That's where our nation's food is produced. It goes all the way up to the East Coast and into Canada. And I've met people along the way when I was doing research, I met a doctor in Missouri who talked about high rates of cancer there and he linked it to testing. I met a journalist in Albany who had written a book about what one test in 1953 did to that community. Um, it, it collided with the worst thunderstorm in a hundred years, rained out all over that area. The rates of thyroid cancer there are high, the rates of Hodgkin's disease, um, lymphomas. Um, and so I've met people from many of these areas, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, downwind from all these areas. And I show this map because still in the US, people have no idea how far it went. They think it was just this narrow little area around Nevada, the bottom of Nevada, the bottom of Utah. But I think it's important they know where it went because it affected their communities. Um, so that's, that's the map and that's why I carry it. And every time I pull it out, people gasp. So that's why I carry that. Tom, let's come back to Mary now. Um, Mary, the other thing that you told me is that that map, the research shows that every county in the United continental United yes. States has been in, uh, impacted by nuclear testing. Right, right. So even with all that I knew about this, I did not know about this. And um, yeah, it's just, uh, and you said there were how many um, thyroid cancers that they estimated? Well, the, the, yeah, the National Cancer Institute did a study in 97 and they went county by county. They estimated that 212,000 lifetime cases of thyroid cancer are linked to testing. And that's just one of the cancers that's caused by fallout. And it's the easiest one to get rid of. So they only looked at that. They tried to keep that secret. It had to be leaked. It's a huge, big, long study. Um, there was another study that came out just in 2019 from the University of Arizona that said that probably up to 500,000 people, largely in the Midwest and the East, died because of contaminated agriculture from fallout. Yeah. Well. Um, it's really, it's really um, important information that gets out there so people understand yeah. where this is coming from. Um, I wanted to, just moving along in mindful of time, um, you share your story in so many different ways. You testify, you travel, um, and we're going to come in a moment to the play, but you yeah. have been to Hiroshima and uh, maybe you could share your most memorable moment there. Um, oh, oh, definitely. Um, the first time I went was in 2005 for the 60th anniversary. I went with American Studies and I gave a speech to the university there and a woman came up to me afterwards in tears and, and told me that I was an American Habakkusha. That's a survivor of the bomb. And she, her name's Coco and she was eight months old when the bomb fell on Hiroshima. Her father is the minister who is in John Hersey's book, Hiroshima, and she was just stunned by that story. That's her there on the left. And then Peter Kuznick, who's the head of the um, Nuclear Studies Institute at American University. But the people I met there, I thought they should hate us for what we did to them. And, and here they were feeling sorry for me. It was, it was an unbelievable experience, just unbelievable. And I thought, you know, we're all we're all victims everywhere. We're all victims. So that, yeah. And then I went back in 2015 to speak and met people from around the country again who are working on this issue and at every part of that nuclear cycle. And 
it's it's devastating, you know, to be there is is devastating. Yeah. But well, um, oh yeah, that was me testifying in 2015 in Hiroshima. Yeah, yeah. And, and then I think we have one more photo here, Tom. Yeah, this was days of a remembrance. Do you know that it took us until 2011 to get the U.S. Congress to declare January 2017 uh, or 27th Down Winter's Day of Remembrance. That's the anniversary of the first bomb exploded in, at the Nevada test site. It took us till 2011 to get them to recognize that. But it's a, an official day of remembrance now. Yeah. And I know you've spoken at a lot of those, Mary. Thank you. Um, yeah. Now I want to come to your play. Yeah. Um, you've talked a little bit about what made you decide to share the story in a play, but but what was the moment where you decided to write a play and had you ever written a play before and what was it like yeah. for you and what was most challenging for you and sure. inspiring and did it take a long time and what mentoring yeah. advice would you offer people here today who maybe have never written a play before or a movie but have a have a really important story to tell especially on this issue sure sure well you know what um where it started i was supposed to be writing a book and i had this manuscript but i kind of didn't do anything with it i was on a plane reading the minutes of the atomic energy commission i just thought oh my god this plays out like high drama nobody would believe this this plays out like high drama i'm just going to write some monologues because I've written monologues that have been producing. So I'm just going to write monologues. And then I started thinking, well, you know what? I've interviewed so many people. I'm going to tell their stories. I'm going to just have this. And then I met this woman who was an actress in LA. And um, she said, no, 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 you're, you're missing the biggest part of the story. You have to tell your story. I said, I can't. It's just too painful. She said, Mary, cut open your veins and bleed. And that's what I did. I just blood all over that. I'd sit at my little laptop just crying while I wrote scenes. And then I met another woman who is a, a, a real playwright and she became my mentor. I would meet with her once a week, bring her scenes. And she would tell me, oh, I love what you're doing here, this blah, blah, blah. And I had no idea what she's talking about. I was just doing it. And um, it was so hard to write because I would sit there and cry. And when I got to the part about my sister, I thought, I, I can't do this, I can't do this. And um, but she's the one who told a director in town that I was working on this. And he called me up and said, um, I want to read your play. I said, no, 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 it's not finished. It's not finished. And he said, I don't care. I'm going on vacation. I have time to read it. Send it to me. And he called me the next morning and said, I'm opening my next season with this. And I'm like, no, it's not finished. It's not finished. He goes, it will be. It will be. And, and the interesting thing was when we first workshopped that, Every time I workshop this with any group or do um, rehearsals for readings, the cast ends up crying so hard we have to stop and they start telling their stories. Everyone's got a story to tell connected to that issue. And, and when that play opened in Salt Lake um, at its big premiere, and it was extended, by the way, another two weeks, um, it ends with a reading of the list of the dead. And we would invite people to go out in the hallways and put, there was, we put a big butcher paper. We said, add names of people you want to add. Well, after a few nights, we had so many names, we couldn't keep doing it. Um, and we would have talk backs. I would do them every night afterwards. It was so hard to do those because even now when I pull together the clips for you, I just start sobbing when I see it. And the, the, they were so nice. They did a, special screening for a run of it for my family because everyone in there is real it's my family it's my sister it's, it's the people I knew all I didn't make up anyone in there they're all real and I use their names and um my family was sitting around me that was the hardest hardest night of that play and I had my niece on one side my nephew on the other side and they were shaking so hard from crying and my poor father who was not doing well at the time, he just said, can you please write a comedy next time? Yeah, so that's, that's the play.
And I think you have a, a clip. Yeah, share. yeah. Tom, maybe we can just show the clip now. I'm just looking at, at the time. It would be really great to see the clip. And, and do you this, want to tell this, us before, yeah, before this, you play this, it, Tom? This is the monologue. The woman who plays me comes out at the very end after they've had a big success in stopping another test at the test site. It was which was called divine strike. Nothing divine about that, but but people like us got that thing stopped. And this is her closing thing before the names are read. Now that you've won, what do you do next? The reporters want to know. We take care of the sick and dying. That's what we do. The same day they announced the cancellation of Divine Strike, a friend of mine found out she had ovarian cancer, stage three. She's the sixth one in her family to get cancer. And just last week, she told me she felt like a walking time bomb. Now she's in surgery. And Michelle's favorite brother died of cancer the same week. Susan Cantrell, my best friend in junior high, she died of lupus a few months ago. And in the paper, I found an obituary for Georgia Elizabeth Welty. Under her name, it says, another downwinder passes. I was in high school with her daughter. More names for the list. The hardest part is not the dying. It's that the dead are so easily forgotten. We're fighting for all of them so that their lives will serve as a warning so that it won't happen again. It's exhausting, but the fight also gives us strength. We set brush fires in people's minds so that one day we can watch those fires suddenly burst into one glorious, raging blaze. Attention has been paid. My sister and all the others will not disappear. Let our lists end here. And then they read the names in a cacophony and they're just got to be so many, they get quieter and quieter. And the very last name is my sister's. Well, um, I just want to say the power of story and um, yeah. Thank you for sticking with that and and creating something that can go on and on and on. And um, I know you'd like your play to be seen all over. Oh yeah. I just I just want to say that if anyone is interested in bringing Mary's play to where you are in your community, she'd love to hear from you. And um, we're putting Mary's email in the chat if you. If you have thoughts about her play, right. it's been to many places already, but you've said that you'd like it to be seen as widely as possible. And so. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I would. I just think people need to know this story. And, and we would see the end of nuclear weapons if, if people understood their impact. Um, you've talked about this is just briefly, and I know it's not a brief answer, but I want to move on to Lisa momentarily sure. I just wanted to ask, you know, what would restorative justice begin to look like for you as a downwinder? Um, and how can women support and spread the word about what you're doing in your advocacy work? Um, sure. And how can they get involved to support? Okay. Okay, um, justice to me first and foremost would be a nuclear test never being conducted again, would be the abolition of nuclear weapons, number one. I know there, there is a move afoot and there is something called the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act. Um, you get $50,000 if you got sick or if someone died. So a life apparently is worth $50,000. Um, and there's some, but it's only for a very narrow little area. There's, there are some bills right now trying to expand compensation to 11 more states and to up the amount to 150,000. 
which means a life is now worth double what it was years ago, um, or triple, sorry. Uh, but really the, the biggest thing would for justice is just never ever do it again. And, and I think for me, just other people telling the story and getting the word out and saying, the effects are so much more expansive than we ever thought. And, and anyone who wants that map will send you the file. I think showing that map for me has, has been the thing that always gets people. Yeah. Thank you, Mary, a beginning. Oh, thank you, thank you. I really appreciate you and the others here. I'm just blown away, yeah. Lisa, we now come to you. Hi, Cynthia. We're so happy to have you with us. You're, you're dedicating yourself to sharing stories, as you say in your podcast, quote, about the risk of nuclear disaster, how close we have come and how close we still are today, unquote. And I just want to thank you for your courage, for all you're doing to awaken people to the escalating nuclear danger and what we can do to transform our nuclear legacy and especially for working so hard to engage your generation. And I really wanted to end the program with you because you're doing so much in, in your mission to engage your generation and carry this work forward into the future. And that brings, that brings me hope. So thank you for what you're doing and welcome. And so my first question to you like the others is, what was that turning point moment in your life what moved you to dedicate yourself to sharing at the brink stories to transform our nuclear legacy? And why have you chosen, chosen storytelling as a catalyst for change and as a way to make a difference? Well, as you uh, started uh, when you introduced me, uh, it was my grandfather who was my inspiration. And it was uh, really his story and in fact, his many stories that inspired me to get involved in nuclear activism. And in fact, um, it was something that I had no idea about, that I, I didn't know anything about, that I wasn't engaged on until I learned about his story. So for me, stories around this issue are everything to me. They're very much what got me here. They're what continue to keep me going. And, and to me through, I've been working on nuclear issues now for the past uh, five years have been really the thing that keeps me going and uh, the most powerful tool that I've found in my arsenal to work on this issue, so. Well, I really love what you just said. Stories are everything to me. So um, with that in mind, would love for you to share your presentation now about your journey with these stories and at the brink. So um, as Cynthia introduced, uh, I have a podcast now, it's called At the Brink, um, but it really is a story, my story that I'll be telling you today. Um, I felt seemed appropriate to be sharing um, stories in this uh, discussion today. Um, my story is about stories. Uh, my journey began uh, mm. with another person's story. It was my grandfather's story. Um, my grandfather is William J. Perry. Um, he was the 19th Secretary of Defense under Clinton for his first term. So that was in 1992, um, 1993 to 1997. And at that time when he was first uh, in office, uh, I was six years old. So um, I knew that there are big, important things happening, but I didn't really understand um, what it meant that he was doing. Um, I just knew that he you know, had traveled the world a lot um, and dealt with lots of important things. So it actually wasn't until about um, it was six, six or seven years ago um, I'm well into my 20s, that my grandfather came to us, uh, to the whole family, and said, you know, I, I'm, I'm ready, I would like to write my memoir. Uh, and we were all very excited. Uh, I wanted to learn. He 
my grandfather done so many things throughout his life and I wanted to know exactly what they were. Um, and he, but he told us as a family said, well, I wanna write my memoir and I wanna write it about nuclear weapons. And the truth was that we were surprised. I was surprised. I, I was confused. I, you know, nuclear weapons, what, what does nuclear weapons have to do with your story? What is it about nuclear weapons that that's what you wanna write your memoir about? Um, because I, I really had no idea how much of his entire career in his entire lifetime had centered around the narrative of nuclear weapons. Uh, so it was when his memoir, this book, uh, My Journey at the Nuclear Brink came out about seven years ago, six years ago, that I finally understood what was really at stake. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the nuclear narratives that I had before that, the reason why this was such a surprise. Um, I am a uh, solidly a millennial. I was born in 1987. Um, the Cold War would end just a few years after I was born. And I was raised to believe that nuclear weapons were a thing of the past or a thing from movies. Um, the way that nuclear weapons were depicted to me were things that you use to destroy aliens or blow up asteroids, um, you know, things that were in action movies or um, comic books. The way that it was presented was that this was sort of a, a plot point or a fantasy element, that this wasn't something to really be taken seriously or be really considered, that it was just um, it, this fantastical sort of narrative that was being painted. Um, and then on the other side of that was, I, I was actually quite a big history fan and a history buff um, throughout my earlier school years. And the way that history is talked about, history is very much a collection of stories and the stories we choose to tell in history make a big difference for how we understand moving forward. And the way that nuclear weapons are presented in at least United States history and education as, as this was a problem of the past, that this was a problem that happened during the Cold War, that this was something we made mistakes, we, this was a, an issue, um, the nuclear arms race was you know, and, and mutually assured destruction was all these crazy things that we did. And, and in fact, it was even acknowledged the sort of test that you would take, oh, well, you know, the nuclear arms race of the 50s and 60s were a big mistake because we ended up with, you know, hundreds of thousands of nuclear weapons and, and that was crazy. But then we learned and we moved on. What was never told in those histories was that they didn't go away. There wasn't a time when we just said, oh, well, you know, it, and then the Cold War ended and everything's fine. And, and you know everyone went home and, and everything's safe now. But for some reason, and, and there was understandably a lot of relief after the end of the Cold War, people I think didn't wanna be afraid and terrified anymore. They, they wanted to believe that this was the end of the danger. Um, and in fact, my grandfather was one of those people in a way that he saw there were positive changes being made after the Cold War. Um, and he thought that we were on a trajectory to work towards nuclear elimination. And the problem was without that concern and without that public attention, we no longer were paying attention to this issue. We were no longer pushing for things. Um, and what that meant is that we let things start to slip backwards. And when I read my grandfather's book, the thing that struck me the most um, was something that he stated in that book, which was this, that the threat of nuclear weapons today is greater than during the Cold War, that he believes the risk is greater now for my generation than any time during his generation. And as someone who was 
a, a history buff and, and understood the the risk there, I, I was completely blown away. I, in fact, I was actually quite angry and and confused that I said, you know, if this is real and, and my grandfather is one of the smartest people that I've ever known and I fully trust his analysis and his understanding of the issues. I, I wanted to know why is no one talking about this? Why did I not know about this? I'm someone who's always been, I'm quite involved in um, activist issues and social issues um, and no one that I knew in my generation, in millennials, we're talking about nuclear weapons, not in any serious way, not in any way that that actually pushed forth an agenda or or demanded change. And that's how I got activated into this is through his story. And from there, um, my grandfather started a foundation, the William J. Perry Project, which I then joined initially just to try to amplify his story. Um, I came on as a communications director to try and help amplify his message for my generation to try to translate it. And, and so that my generation bring it onto the internet, um, make it so that people like me um, could understand that, hey, you know, this, this is something we need to be waking up to. Um, this is something that is real and, and we, we've completely forgotten about it, or in fact, we've never really learned about it. Um, so from here, um, for the past five years with the William J. Perry Project, we have, um, as our goal as a project, is, is purely public awareness and, and attention raising to these issues. So we consider ourselves an educational foundation. Um, and we're just a very small out group and we've tried a number of different approaches on how to reach people about these issues, um, really trying whatever it is that we can do to get people's attention. And uh, partly what I wanna share today with everyone is, is some of the things that we've learned because um, it is difficult to try and understand how to reach people about this. There's so many things in this world that are vying for people's attention. And there are understandably a lot of other issues that are important and need attention as well. And when it comes to nuclear weapons, it can be one of those things that people say, my attention span is too much. There's too many important things for me to focus on. I, I can't possibly add one more thing in there. So you need to find the thing that will grab their attention, that will make them understand this is not something you can just push aside and say, well, we'll get to that later, that we have these things we need to handle. We'll get to nuclear weapons later because the issue with nuclear weapons is that there may not be a later. And I wanna share in particular, the one story that, um, as we went around with the William J. Perry Project, um, we did a number of things. We did um, online courses. Uh, my grandfather, after his tenure as Secretary of Defense, um, went on to teach at Stanford um, and taught defense theory. And with his experience as a professor, the first thing that he wanted to do was try to bring these courses online to directly educate people about the issues. Uh, we also did um, YouTube videos describing different scenarios that he had created depicting the issues that he had envisioned. And we did lots and lots of talks and meetings and events um, amplifying the messages and the experiences and the knowledge that he gained over a lifetime of working directly with nuclear weapons. But what we learned, what I viewed, was that the stories that he told, the personal experiences that he had, were the things that really connected with people, that really made people understand the gravity of this issue. In particular, the favorite story that he liked to tell was this one about his 3 a.m. phone call, 
which was um, before he was Secretary of Defense under Bill Clinton, he was Under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering for President Carter. And this was in the 70s. Um, during the height of the Cold War, uh, at the time when we have tens of thousands of nuclear weapons and we are on heightened alert. My grandfather, while he was undersecretary, was woken up at three in the morning by a phone call from the watch officer of the North Air American Air Command Center. The watch officer told him that his, uh, his facility was reporting 300 intercontinental ballistic missiles inbound for the United States at that moment. Woken up with this phone call. My grandfather describes he thought that that was the last moments of his life. The watch officer quickly then amended his statement to say, well, we, we believe that it is a false alarm, but we don't know why. And we're calling you to try and figure out what has gone wrong with our alert system. It took them two days to figure out that the problem with the system was that someone had inserted a training tape into the system and they were viewing a training scenario not an actual alert. And it was this story in particular that he would share with people to tell them that the risks that we talk about, that many anti-nuclear activists talk about, that nuclear weapons present, the vulnerabilities are not a hypothetical to him. They are very real because he lived through them. He saw exactly how close that we could come to starting nuclear war by accident, much less on purpose. And he knew very intimately that there are flaws in the system, that humans make mistakes, and there are no ways to completely mistake-proof any system ever. And in fact, that false alarm was one of a number of false alarms that have happened throughout our history. And from there, after working on these various projects, um, trying to raise attention with varying success, um, what we found ourselves struggling with was a lot of the time we were preaching to the choir. And I think that can be a really difficult thing in the nuclear activism space, because this is a quite a small space. Um, there are a num you know, a smaller number of people who are working on this issue because there is not this larger public attention on it right now. And it can be hard to really amplify our message beyond that. We were always very blessed with, because of who my grandfather was, being a public figure that we were able to get somewhat larger of an attention just using his name as a platform. But even with that, we found that oftentimes we were talking to people who already agreed with us, who already knew about these issues. And the problem is that's not who we need to be talking to. We need to be talking to, in particular, our focus is people who didn't know anything about this. People like myself, which the thing that I always like to describe that how how real it is that my generation doesn't know about this is that I grew up with my grandfather and I didn't know anything about this, that I was completely unaware of these issues until he taught me about these issues. And I think that shows just how blind, particularly my generation and the generation, generation Z, are just due to exposure and we need to find a way to expose them to these issues. But it's difficult because we do not have the ever present news agenda, the things that are happening as it was during the Cold War. We have to find different ways to connect people with these issues. And seeing how his stories would connect with people became the inspiration for the next project we took on, which was the podcast. 
And that's where we came up with At the Brink, inspired by my grandfather's memoir title um, and inspired by his stories. We wanted to find a way to really focus on telling other people's stories and making this issue personal, making this something that's real because nuclear weapons are often this thing that people feel as it's so big and it's so monumental. And, and people say, well, um, when it comes down to it, most of the people you ask agree that nuclear weapons are bad. It, that's not the fight we need to be fighting is, is to convince people that yes, nuclear weapons are bad or they're scary or they're dangerous. Most people agree with that. The, the fight we need to fight is how do we connect them with understanding what exactly the risks are and then giving them the tools to push for change. But that's a complicated thing because nuclear weapons are big and they are complicated. But what personal stories can do is they bring it down to a human level. They bring it down to this level that I'm connecting with, you know, not a, a policy suggestion, but I'm connecting with this person's story. I'm connecting with their experience and I can relate to that. I can't relate to, you know, there's a thousand ICBMs in a silo in somewhere in the Midwest that I've never been to, or in, you know, the people that suffered in Hiroshima and Nagasaki 75 years ago in a country I've never been to, people I'll never see. They, they need to hear and feel and experience why these are risks, why there are danger here. Um, and I want to share a few of the lessons that we've learned as we've been telling these stories and as I've been trying to reach people so that you can, as you try and see where you fit into your anti-nuclear activism journey. Um, so I first want to say that I think it's really important to play to your strengths that this is a huge field and there's a lot of problems. There's a lot of different angles that we can take on this issue. And you don't have to take everything on. Find something that you connect with, that you engage on and choose that and focus on that. Um, working to fight a large entrenched industry such as nuclear weapons, it, this is a marathon, it's not a sprint. Um, my grandfather has likened it to climbing a mountain that sometimes, you know, you, you may not even see the top of the mountain yet, but you're charting a path and you just have to get further up the mountain so you can at least see the top. We have to help move people up the mountain so that the top is visible so that they can understand that there is a place that we can go to beyond nuclear weapons and finding a way that you can find a place in this field that you can keep a pace that you're not gonna burn yourself out, you're not gonna take too much on. And as you're hearing from all of the different people in this program, not just today, but all of the sessions, you can hear all of the different work that people are doing on this, uh, on this issue that this is really a collaborative effort. You know, and you will find that that people working on this are not just willing, but eager and interested to collaborate with other people working on this, that we recognize that all of the work that we do supports all of the other work that other people do to try to move the needle, to try and, and raise awareness because there is a threshold that we're trying to reach of public awareness. There is a, a theory stating if, if we reach I believe it's a 20% awareness of an issue is sort of this watershed point where once just that smaller amount of people are aware, that's when the really big changes happen. Um, and anything that you do, like there's nothing that is unimportant when it comes to this work. If it's just that you're talking with your neighbors, you're talking with your friends and your family, that is important work. In fact, sometimes that's the most important work because those people know you, you have a personal relationship with them. 
they trust you, they trust your opinion, and they're more likely to listen to you if you go to them and share your information and your perspective on these things. Um, and working with my grandfather, uh, I came into this field, you know, not just a, as a non-expert, but as, you know, completely ignorant to so many things about this. And I've had to take, you know, a really intensive crash course in, um, nuclear weapons policy, history, um, uh, technological aspects. I'm very grateful and lucky that I've had a, a world-class tutor on the subject. Um, but I have been had the privilege of going to many of the meetings that he's had. I've gotten to witness um, many of the speeches and the talks that he gives. Um, and I'm here to tell you that it's not just the experts who deserve to have an opinion on this issue because nuclear weapons are not just going to affect the experts. They're going to affect everyone, which means that everyone deserves and allows themselves to have an opinion on this issue because it affects all of us. So do not let anyone tell you that you don't know anything enough to have an opinion on this, that you don't deserve to have a voice on this subject because you do, and everyone does, that you are allowed to speak on this just by nature of you are a human being on this earth who could be impacted by nuclear weapons. That is all the expertise you need. And yes, educate yourself on the issue just so you can make better arguments and advocate for actual changes but don't let anyone shut you down as if you do not deserve to have a voice. I also wanna speak particularly with this group on what it's like to be a woman, a woman in this field and on working on this issue. There are so many amazing women who I've met and got to work with working on this issue, um, but for a long time and, and including with my um, my grandfather's history and in the work that he's done, it mostly has been surrounded by older white men. And, and that has an impact um, and it is starting to change, but it's, you know, it's a progress. And I wanna talk about the fact that uh, being a woman or the other marginalized groups who have for so long not had a voice on this issue is not just a matter of ticking off a diversity box, that there is a real valuable reason why we need diverse voices on this issue, not just because obviously nuclear weapons affect all of us, but that we actually bring diverse perspectives. And one of the things that my grandfather has often talked about being a problem in this field is that there are too many, what he calls, uh, people who are stuck in Cold War thinking. Um, but particularly what he means is that they're in an echo chamber, that too many people have been stuck saying the same things for decades and decades, and they've all convinced themselves that their perspective and their opinion on these issues is the only one that matters, and it's the only one that's right. And we need to find a way to muscle our way in to say, no, that there are other important and valid perspectives on these things. And it's important for you to listen. And particular, uh, as women, we are, there are many things that we have been enculturated in that we have um, uh, bestowed upon us through our experiences as women that actually bring us great strength when it comes to working on this issue. And the problem is it's often painted by oppositional forces as weakness. And I think it's really important that we reject that narrative. Uh, empathy is strength. Empathy is important. And anyone who says that empathy and logic or empathy and strategy are somehow oppositional forces that they contradict each other is wrong. Empathy is necessary. And in fact, I, I've heard some amazing stories from people who are you know, in, in these um, closed meetings, these discussion section, sessions, talking about um, making decisions about our nuclear forces, about how strategies for, for nuclear weapons and um, one woman I spoke to talked about the 
revelation she had when when they were just throwing around numbers of casualties that might happen in various scenarios that they were discussing. Oh, you know, 100,000, 1 million, 500,000 people. But they were not even re referencing this as people. These were just numbers on a map. And the truth is that that's actually insane, that it's insane to be talking about this, talking about numbers of potential deaths of human beings as if they're just on a pawns on a chessboard. And uh, as women, we have been enculturated to foster empathy, to foster caretaking. And that is the type of voice and the type of energy um, and effort that we actually need to bring more in, onto this issue, that we need to have that perspective, that humanity into this so that we actually start to push for change to transition away from nuclear weapons as a defense strategy tool to nuclear weapons as a humanitarian problem. Um, and a lot of the times the things that I hear uh, that I find frustrating is, is the definitions and the way we think about things like strength and security uh, are very patriarchal terms, the way that are defined, that somehow nuclear weapons are painted as being strong. The more nuclear weapons we have, the stronger we are. But I disagree with that. I think not just as an opinion, but the facts demonstrate that nuclear weapons actually weaken us both as a nation and as a global humanity because they, <laughs> they threaten us, they are a threat. Nuclear weapons are not strength, they are a threat. And security is seen as, you know, the more firepower, the more you have the ability to harm someone else is seen as something that makes you more secure. But I think, again, I, I want you to question these patriarchal assumptions about what is good, what is strong, and what is powerful. Because I think that empathy, that showing empathy, the ability to translate your empathy is incredibly powerful, is an incredibly strong tool that we can use and utilize for the good of humanity. And just to conclude, to talk a little bit about storytelling and my personal experience, and we've had um, really enjoyed hearing um, from Mary and Tugzan about their journeys into storytelling and, and to find the power in storytelling, because I really agree that it's such a transformational power to use these, um, is that if you're going to try to use stories in your activism, I, I want you to think about, uh, and it's one of the things that we've done as we've made these podcasts that we try to use these to anchor ourselves when we write our scripts and we, we find these stories is how can you make it personal? How can you make it human? How can you bring it into someone's living room? And taking nuclear weapons away from, you know, these metal objects in a hole in the ground in the middle of the country to, you know, this was my, you know, the moment where I thought that I was going to die, or this was the moment where I, I um, in fact, I, I should um, say that one of the more powerful moments, I think, in our whole first season, and the reason that I um, first got to meet and interact with Cynthia was that um, our very first episode, uh, we tell Cynthia's story. We told Cynthia's story about experiencing the Hawaii false alarm. Um, several years ago. And uh, that story that Cynthia tells is incredibly powerful. And it in that she talks about how she had this revelation moment of nuclear weapons are not just potentially the end of my life. It could be the end of my family's life. It could be the end of all humanity that I know of forever. And finding that crystallizing moment to bring that into people's understanding, not just conceptualizing it, but feeling it 
is an incredibly powerful transformational moment. And um, to again, bring it back to what it is to harness our um, feminine power for good, emotion is not a bad thing. I think you should understand that emotion is important and necessary for this work. And sometimes it can be difficult. And again, it comes back into the notion that, you know, reclaiming the definition of strength, I think feeling emotions is an incredibly strong thing to do. And when I took, uh, I got to listen to Cynthia's story probably 30 or 40 times as we were editing the podcast, uh, putting things together. And every time, every time that I listened to that story, I felt it emotionally. I got choked up. I, you know, felt my eyes tearing up. And, and I've heard it, you know, even just in this discussion today, um, you know, we've had that emotion in our voice. We have felt that emotion and don't run away from that. That is power. That is strength. Like let yourself feel it and, and allow yourself to share that emotion with other people because that is what is at stake here that emotion is real and, and those feelings are real. Um, and I want you to try and use these stories to make people question their assumptions. There are so many assumptions that have been put out there for this last 75 years that nuclear weapons have been around that somehow nuclear weapons make us more secure, that we can't possibly eliminate nuclear weapons or we can't possibly roll back um, nuclear weapons back towards somewhere where we used to be that somehow we haven't fought wars anymore because nuclear weapons are around. Well, I would say that the hundreds of thousands of victims of wars over the last 75 years would disagree with you. Um, bring these stories to make people question, oh, well, I, I never thought about it like that. Um, my grandfather's 3 a.m. story made people question, oh, I, I thought that you know our alert system was secure that we couldn't possibly have a mistake that there, you know, that things are okay, that the people at the top have everything to get everything together and, you know, everything's fine. I don't need to think about this. And what his story does is, is it put plants that seed of, well, maybe I was wrong. Maybe I need to think about this some more. And the last thing, and genuinely, I think, one of the hardest things in this work and the hardest thing that we found in creating this podcast is that nuclear weapons are scary and they should be scary because they that's the reality but try not to make that the only thing that you focus on as you try to lean into this work because if you just scare people, if you just say, hey, here's this big, terrible, scary thing, people are going to run away. People are going to reject it. They don't want to just be scared because it's paralyzing. If, if you're scared with, with nothing to do, you feel powerless, you will just tune it out, you'll ignore it just as a safety mechanism. What you have to try and find a way to do is with that fear, with that emotion, with those connections is to also give people hope, give people a reason to want to take action, give people a sense of agency. And that can be very difficult to do. And, and, and that's something that you have to try and find case by case of like what issues you're working on, what it can be. Um, and sometimes it's even just a matter of, you know, telling them about about the work that other people are doing or, or changes that have happened um, and saying, you know, this is, this is a marathon, not a sprint, but we're working and, and we keep going. Um, in fact, I would say, um, I'll, I'll close my presentation with, I think my personal favorite story in regards to that, that we've done with this season of At the Brink, which is, um, the story of Setsuko Thurlow, who is a Hibakusha um, Hiroshima survivor. Um, she was 13 years old when Hiroshima, when the attack of, on Hiroshima happened. 
Um, I had the great privilege and honor of getting to interview her in person um, over a number of hours to hear her story. And she has spent a lifetime traveling the world trying to tell her story and advocate for people, um, advocate for herself and for the world to try to bring about the elimination of nuclear weapons. And uh, in the last several years has been a major player in the United Nations Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And in our episode on the podcast, um, we tell her story in Hiroshima. But then at the end, I got to ask her about today and why she keeps doing this work at 83, why she continues to tell her story, even though she says it's the most painful thing that she knows. And she told me about the story of the day in the United Nations when the treaty was passed. And she said that people were jumping up and cheering and you know overcome with excitement and she said you know I, I i couldn't do that in that moment i i couldn't join them because i had to take that moment and i i had to talk to all of the people that we lost in hiroshima and nagasaki and she says you know i, I know it was strange but i was talking to the dead in that moment. And I was telling them, you know, this was for you. You know, we, we got here that we're not there yet, but we're going to keep pushing and we're going to keep going, you know, and we will get there, you know, and she is seen in her lifetime, you know, from that moment and that day in Hiroshima, to now 75 years later, where we're now instituting international law to ban nuclear weapons that although at times it may seem that nothing changes, but progress is happening. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Cynthia. Lisa, um, that was brilliant. And so deeply moving and such a gift and so inspiring for us, especially after hearing from Mary and Togjan. Um, and I just have to say that really acknowledge your grandfather in my life because the reason that we're all here today and the reason that nuclear alert had the meaning that it did to me is because I had the privilege of interviewing him in 2017 and in that interview, I was reawakened. I thought the Cold War was over. I thought I could stop worrying. I did thought it was an old problem. I was working on climate change. When he said to me what you have said, and I say in every session that, and quote him, but I left that for you in this session, that we're at a greater risk today of a nuclear catastrophe than at any time in history and that most people are blissfully unaware of this danger and that we're sleepwalking into a nuclear catastrophe when we must wake up. That was for me a huge wake up call. And it was with that was on my mind very shortly after that when I went through the alert, which is why I underwent a, a transformation in my life and why really that I'm here and that we're all here. So I have to credit him for the incredible, um, his incredible dedication at 92, 90. You just turned 93 last month. 93 with all the grandchildren that he's dedicating his life to this. And now he's brought you and the rest of the family in, and you're carrying this on in such a beautiful way. I'm looking in the chat and someone who's young Keiko said, this is really important for our generation, you know, so thank you. This was really, really a gift to all of us. Um, I want to come now to just the last question for you, Lisa, is um, if you could just summarize um, in a few words where you're planning to go from here with the podcast and how people here can 
um, spread the word. And I just want to say um, that if you if you haven't subscribed, if you haven't listened, every episode is amazing. And I've learned something there. Every episode, like Lisa's presentation, is a teaching. So um, we're going to put the your website in the chat, um, Tom, if you could do that for, so people can subscribe. But maybe you could just give us a little update on what's next. And then we'll yeah, so um, we actually have some amazing news. Uh, we're about to wrap um, the end of this first season, which was nine episodes. Um, and we are in the process um, of getting a grant to make a season two. And it looks like um, it's not fully finalized yet, but we have uh, sort of all the green lights to go that uh, a season two looks like it is going to happen. And we're, we're really thrilled to be able to do that. Um, and we have plans as well for a season three. So we're crossing our fingers for that. Um, and that should come sometime in um, summer of next year, we hope, for a season two. And in particular, um, at, at the brink is the, the first season that we did, um, we really leaned in on, on, as I said, we leaned in on our strengths, which was all of my grandfather's connections with government individuals, with people, um, a lot of people in positions of power, a lot of the mo movers and shakers, um, but that's not all of the people that are important in this. And um, we're trying to transition and move um, as we continue the podcast into focusing on um, the voices and the stories of people who are often unheard. And we're hoping, and I'm really you know excited to share this, particularly in this session, that we're hoping season two to be dedicated and focused on um, uh, nuclear testing and production. So we're hoping to particularly focus on all of those stories that, you know, Mary and Toxan is trying to elevate um, to try to get that message out and, and so people understand, you know, that what is at risk. It's not just, it's not just countries playing chess with one another, that it's, it's you know, people, it's your neighbors, um, you know, it's people down the street. Um, and oh, you, you asked about, um, uh, how people can help and support. Um, definitely, we always ask, like sharing it to whatever networks you have, doesn't matter how big or small. Um, the whole point of the podcast is to try to get the message out there. And uh, we really tried to focus on um, making this podcast not specifically a nuclear wrong podcast. This is really tailored for the general pu uh, public for anyone um, that we try to explain all of the details, all of the issues, you don't need to know anything or understand anything about nuclear weapons beforehand. This, you know, the podcast is your primer and, you know, you can share it with anyone. Uh, definitely subscribing um, on, it is available on all the major podcast services. Subscribing really helps us um, get more attention because the more subscribers we get, the more it shows up on other people's news feeds. Um, and also we always ask um, reviewing, particularly on Apple podcasts is really important for us. Giving us five stars and writing a review um, brings more attention and gives people that's, um, you know, gives people that sense of like, oh, I, I want to tune into this or I, you know, thinking that, you know, nuclear weapons are not just a niche issue, they're an every person issue, so. Thank you, congratulations on the second season and how Thank perfect, you. had no idea that it would be focused on um, people like Togjan and Mary sharing their stories and, and the stories of the people who have been impacted by nuclear testing, that's extraordinary. And so thank you for, for letting us know that. So we're almost out of time for the session. I wanna just um, bring the session to a close and then Auntie Puna will offer a blessing at the end of the session. Um, and I wanna thank all of you mentors for joining us today, for sharing your, your passion, your stories, your insight, your wisdom, your gifts, um, and deep bows of gratitude for, to each of you for all you do every day to transform our nuclear legacy. It's just so, so grateful. And I wanna thank all the women who are gathered here from all over the world for being with us, again, for claiming your seat at the table with us to eliminate nuclear weapons. Um, and I just want to say that all the mentors here are inviting you to join them. They're welcoming you. They're inviting us to roll up our sleeves and get to work and get this done with them. And there's not a moment for us to spare. 
They've offered their contact information for engagement, for collaboration. This is on our website. We're post posting the link now in the chat. Um, but we, this is really an invitation to all of you with us today to really discover what your story is in connection to all of this and, and bring it to, to the world, to your friends, family. Um, and our mentors have all offered resources for you that are on our website. We're creating a living library there. You can learn so much more about what they're doing. And we also have posted all the recordings on our YouTube channel. So these links are going into the chat. Please share as widely as you're moved. We also have a WhatsApp group. You can join by emailing our mentor, Natalia Jurana, who started it. And our next session is going to be in January. And in the new year, we're going to be looking at a lot of um, themes such as peace and denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula, restoring the nuclear dialogue, arms control, and cooperation on nuclear risk with Russia. Of course, we'll be touching on the meaning um, of the treaty come into, coming into force, strategies for restorative justice for those most disproportionately impacted by nuclear weapons, and the role, of course, that women have to play in all of these efforts, and so much more. I want to thank Tom Dawson for managing our ses Zoom sessions so beautifully, and Colleen Moore from Global Zoom Beyond the Bomb, who's been with us the whole time for all your wonderful live sharing on social media throughout the session today. And now I want to bring back my dear friend and teacher and beloved elder in our community, Auntie Puna. If you're still with us, Auntie, to offer a blessing to close our session. Are you there? Um, let's see, she may not be still there. Okay. Auntie? Okay. So while we're waiting for Auntie, um, I will text her. Um, is there any, do any one of the mentors want to make any closing comments or say anything about their experience today? Uh, since if I may, um, yeah. I, I, I forgot that I had one last slide um, that I wanted to share and that's specific to- We have time. To storytelling um, and um, just to kind of to echo what Mary and Lisa were saying about how stories can be a powerful tool and move people to, to actually do something practical. Uh, since starting to go to the villages, I began writing in a much more um, human, you know, non-academic way, mm -hmm. which took a lot of effort. Um, but I want just to give an example, uh, for example, um, something that happened relatively recently after reading one of my pieces and an American NGO that specializes in uh, medical humanitarian assistance reached out and we are in the mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. of um, getting a, a 40 foot container of um, medical humanitarian of medical supplies to the region that was impacted by the nuclear test so just you know it's 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 my example of how writing something and maybe uh, telling the story in a, in a way that is uh, more emotional can can have some practical implications. So that that's what I wanted to add. Thank you, Talks, and it's really important for people to know how they can engage and help and support. And there's something for all of us to be doing. So I'm so glad that you added that to everything you shared. Um, I'm still waiting for Auntie Puna, so we have a few moments if anyone else would like to say something. Sure. Can I just say what hope this gave me today? Um, sometimes doing this work is such lonely work. And I, I feel like, especially losing so many people who worked on this with me, that I'm kind of the last one of the group I knew. And just seeing what everyone else is doing around the world is so incredibly helpful to me. Um, I'm not alone. People are working on this and I, I honestly think we can make a great difference. It's like planting seeds and you never know where they're sprout. So I just keep throwing them out there. And somebody used to tell me change is slow. It's like ketchup where you hit the bottle, you go ketchup, ketchup in a bottle, nothing changes. And then the bottle, it's a silly, expression and activist I know gave me but um this has been amazing and I'm so glad 
to meet all of you women and to see what you're doing. Thank you. Any of the mentors have any closing words? I would like to take this moment to thank you, Cynthia, for putting this together and, um, you know, for, again, a, as Mary was just saying that um, you know, working on this work collaboratively has been some of the most powerful work that I've done as I've worked in this space. And, um, you know, I, I'm reminded of... Um, when we when we sat down and recorded your interview it, afterwards you you apologized to me you said I, I, i'm sorry i think i was too emotional i i, I hope that wasn't a problem and 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 i i told you as well of course i um you know i didn't want to upset you but you know never apologize for your emotion around this because you know that's what's important and, and that's what we need to hear with this so you know, I want to thank everyone for, for sharing, you know, these difficult things, um, you know, with everyone else so that we, we can feel this. And, and, you know, that's how I've come to my understanding about these things, because, you know, I, I've only learned about these issues through other people's stories. I understand the weight of it through other people's experiences. So thank you. It's an honor and it's, it's joy um, because it is wonderful to, you know, Lisa, you've talked about the collaborative nature of this field and, and um, Mary, how lonely it is. And Togjan, you're out in the middle of the villages on your own uh, there in Kazakhstan. And when we come together there, as, as Puna said at the beginning, and I see she's just joined us again, you know, and we share breath, which is what we say here in Hawaii. And we really, then we become really one unified force and our power is greater. So um, it has really been uh, emotional for me today. Uh, I, I say that proudly, Lisa, thank you. Empathy is strength. Mm -hmm. um, I will remember that, Lisa. Um, so, and I want to just, again, say thank you to everyone. Blessed holidays. See you in January again. And be safe, be well. And Auntie, if you would like to close our session um, with a blessing, we would be really, really thrilled. I'm so honored to hear all of your stories. It's so touching. What is even more um, uh, real to me is that throughout the world where all of you are, you bring the, the intention of aloha you look for solutions, you participate in the communities, you look to help with the healing. So this blanket of peace that we are all a part of, telling your stories, helping others to understand and appreciate that we're not alone, that in every area that we are a part of, we're doing the same work. We're all sharing that intention of aloha. And so I remind all of you, as I say this to all those that are part of this circle of life, akahai is to be kind in that word aloha, to be kind to yourself. Be mindful of being kind to yourself first so that you have the abundance to be kind to everyone else and to do the work and be able to persevere. In that word aloha, lokahi, Lokahi is always being a part of this circle and family of life that we are all a part of. Lokahi is always being inclusive, always looking to see ways that we can participate and be helpful. Olu Olu is to be able to take people into your, your circle, into your arms and gift them with the spirit of your intentions. Ha'a ha'a is to be humble, to realize this whole world is our responsibility. This whole world and especially addressing these powers throughout the world that make decisions for us. We can influence them by being ha'a ha'a, by doing our work, being humble and recognizing the gifts that others share with us. And most especially, 
that last letter, Ahonui, to have the patience, perseverance, caring, love, appreciation for the people that we touch. They are gifts to all of us. So I say to all of you, O ai ke aloha o ke akua ya ka ko a po ke kukui o ke akua ya ka ko. Malama kamana o ke akua ya ka ko. Ke akua ke ki a i maluna o ka ko. Mana vahi a pau o ka ko. Ke akua no. Ke akua i loko o heina ko o. Let us be the beautiful people with a beautiful intention of caring for all those that are put into our alo. Aloha. Aloha, mahalo, Antipuna. Thank you, everyone. Again, blessed holiday. See you in January. Beautiful, beautiful to be together with all of you. Thank you. Mahalo. Mahalo.